Hey guys, welcome back to Med School Moose. This is going to be USMLE Step 1, High Yield Images Part 11. I'm sorry for the delay. My voice was raspy for a couple days and then I got sick for a few days after that, so it was a bit of a struggle. But we are back. Let's go ahead and get started. First image here, starting hot right out of the gate. This is an image. We're obviously doing some fundoscopy here, and what we are seeing is ocular toxoplasmosis. This is a toxo infection that has affected the eye. And really the main feature that we're looking at here is this discolored black and yellowish kind of area, which is a retinochoroidal scar, which is something that can happen with toxoplasmosis. One of the symptoms of that is that it can cause blindness, and this is how it does that. It causes inflammation, chorea retinitis, and it can also cause this retinochoroidal scar. So be sure to commit this one to memory. This one, it's pretty messed up. Nothing else looks like this. If you see it, it's ocular toxoplasmosis. Next image here, we're doing a little bit of histology, and we're getting a nice arrow sign at the base here. What we're seeing is panth cells. Now, if you can recall from histology back in early med school, these are the cells at the base of CRIPS in the mucosa of the small intestine. So we're seeing a crypt here within the small intestine, and right here at the bottom at the base, we're seeing these cells, these panth cells. And what they do is they function in the innate immune system and they protect intestinal stem cells. They're very important. They are part of the immune system, but they're also protecting the intestinal stem cells down at the base of these crypts here. Really important to know that. Next image, we are seeing some microorganisms. I have been drilling this home these past couple of videos because I really want you guys to be able to identify these microorganisms. And in this case, it is Trypanosoma brucei. All right, this is the cause of African sleeping sickness. We need to know it. And what we're seeing here specifically are the trypomastigotes on blood smears. So these are regularly kind of wavy shaped organisms. These are the trypomastigotes. This is the only stage that is found in blood in the infected person. Let me say that one more time. These trypomastigotes that we're seeing on the peripheral blood smear is the only stage that is found in the blood on an infected person. Okay, I really want you guys to know these differences. Last video, High Yield Images Part 10, we talked about treponema pallidum versus leptospira. If you haven't seen that one, definitely go and check it out because you want to be able to identify these differences. In this case, the one that we need to know is trypanosoma brucei. And then to go along with that, what could this be? This is trypanosoma cruzi. This is the cause of Chagas disease. This is another trypomastigote that we're seeing on a peripheral blood smear. And it's really important to know these two and to be able to differentiate between them. So here's a picture where we're going to be able to differentiate. On the left here, we have trypanosoma brucei. On the right here, we have trypanosoma the real big differentiating feature, you can see the arrow sign right here is helping us out. This kind of darker purplish area in both of these organisms is something called a kinetoplast. And what the kinetoplast is, it's an organelle that contains mitochondrial DNA. It's not super important for USMLE step one, but it is something that you want to know to be able to differentiate these two. The kinetoplast in trypanosoma cruzi, as you can see here, it's a bit more peripheral and it's a lot larger compared to the one in trypanosoma brucei. So if for some reason you see these organisms on the exam and you need to identify them, you should be able to do it with the kinetoplast. Next image here, this is a highly abnormal CT of the head. Hopefully you can identify that right off the bat. It looks like Swiss cheese almost. And what we're seeing is neurocystic sarcosis. Nothing else looks like this. It is a parasitic infection caused by tinea solium, which you've discussed before. If you have a patient that has altered mental status and has a CT scan like this, you want to be thinking neurocystic sarcosis, which is caused by tinea solium. Next one here, this can be a little bit difficult to identify, but I did want to show a picture of it. This is herpetic whitlow. We talk about it a lot. It's that herpes infection of the finger. And the thing that we can see kind of on the periphery here, we see some small clear vesicles. We see a little bit of ulcerations. Not everything is in the same stage, but this is going to be on the finger. It's going to be incredibly painful for the patient. Another tip off here in children, it might be starting on the mouth and then it goes to their thumb because they're prone to thumb sucking. So if we see something like this, it's really uncomfortable, really painful. We want to be thinking herpetic Whitlow. This image is an example of Hassel's corpuscles. I know I'm driving a lot of histology home. It's a lot to know and hopefully this will be helpful in allowing you guys to identify these things on the exam. These Hassel's corpuscles, these are concentric masses consisting of one or more granular cells within a capsule of epithelioid cells. So we see these granular cells, there's a few of them in the middle here, and they're surrounded by a capsule of epithelioid cells. And the reason that these are so important is because these can be used to identify the thymus. If you're seeing these and they ask you on the exam what organ this is, nothing else has anything that looks like this, nothing else has these Hassel's corpuscles, so you know that you're in the thymus. So really important to commit that to memory. Next image here, this is an MRI of the brain and we can see an abnormal compared to the other side in this right region over here. You don't need to be a radiologist to read this. Hopefully you can identify that's the right temporal region. And if you're seeing something affecting the temporal region that much, you want to be thinking herpes encephalitis. 
Remember, patients with this can present with altered mental status, and a lot more important, they can present with seizures. So if you have a patient that has seizures, they've been engaging in some high-risk sexual behavior or something like that, and then they show you an MRI or a CAT scan that has an abnormality in the temporal lobe, you want to be thinking temporal lobe encephalitis caused by herpes simplex. Next image here, we're doing a little bit of derm. This is cutaneous larva migraines. This is caused by Ancylostoma duodenale and Necator americanus. This is the infectious larval form that can burrow under the skin and penetrate the epidermis. So this larva is penetrating the epidermis here, and it can be picked up from soil or from sand with contaminated dog feces. That is how it is passed to humans. Contaminated dog feces, the larval form, burrows under the skin, burrows into the epidermis, and you can get this rash, and we call it cutaneous larva migraines. Next image here, hopefully you know this one. We're looking at the esophagus, and there is just a lot of abnormal shapes and contractions going on here. This is diffuse esophageal spasm. All right, really important to know this. If someone does a barium swallow and you see that the esophagus is not uniformly contracting, there's some areas that are very contracted, some areas that are less contracted, it is because it is spasming, and this is diffuse esophageal spasm. Next image here, there's really nothing else that looks like this, so it's really important to know. This is the rash that is seen with dengue fever. They like to test these things like dengue and Ebola a lot more nowadays, so you want to be on the lookout for it. The classic description here, and it's really fitting, well-fitting, it's white islands in a sea of red which you can definitely see here. If you see a patient with this, they have this on the exam, they show you this picture, you want to be thinking dengue fever. This image was actually the cover slide of this video, and hopefully you should be able to identify the histology here. We're looking at blood vessels, and on the left, we have an artery. On the right, we have a vein. How are we going to tell these two apart? Remember the artery, it's a lot stronger, a lot more muscular, and it's going to have a larger tunica media, which we see here. And it's going to keep its shape a lot better because it has all that smooth muscle. It's going to keep that round oval shape. Whereas the vein, on the other hand, does not have as much tunic media. It's going to be bent out of shape a little bit. It's not going to be that perfect round circle. And it may also have some valves within it formed by the tunica intima. So if you see an area that's kind of folded in on itself, you, that should help you be able to identify a vein and that particular area that we were highlighting that is a valve within the vein. Really important to know that. Next here, we have a chest x-ray, and we can obviously see that there's a really big abnormality with the cardiac silhouette there. What are we looking at? Well, this is a sign of a pericardial effusion. The sign that we're talking about here, it's called a water bottle sign. And the reason being is that because this heart is so abnormally shaped, it looks like a water bottle. And that may seem strange until you see this picture. This is kind of an olden day flask or water bottle, I guess. But this is what the heart looks like because there's all of that fluid around it, that effusion around it. So if you see that, you want to be thinking a pericardial effusion. Next image here, we're seeing an abnormality on a patient in the neck area. The thing that we want to be thinking about, especially in a younger patient, is a thyroglossal duct cyst. Remember, this is something that develops in the womb. It develops in the womb, but it is usually present at birth. So it develops before the baby's even born, but when they're born, you can see it. And it's this abnormality. It's kind of an outpouching in the neck here. That's the duct cyst that should have gone away, and it did not. Um, and it can be asymptomatic in most patients it is, but it can also be larger and more severe, and it can cause things like airway issues. So want to be familiar with that. Next one here, we're going back to histology. We see a lot of these round world areas on this slide. And what we're getting at is somoma bodies. Remember, these are microscopic calcifications. They're found in multiple types of tumors. They can be found in a few different brain tissues. But when we see these world kind of like rounded spiral shaped areas, we want to be thinking somoma bodies, and it may be indicative of a tumor. More histology here and a lovely arrow sign to go along with it. This is something called corpora arenacea, which may not mean much to you, but if I say its other name, brain sand, then it may be a little bit more familiar. These are calcified structures in the pineal gland within the brain. Notice I just said somoma bodies are also calcifications that can be found in areas. These two things, it's a little bit unclear. Some people think that cor corpora arenacea is the same thing as somoma bodies. Some people think that they're different entities. But for your studying, I want you to know this by its different name, corpora arenacea, aka brain sand. And the location of this specifically is going to be in the pineal gland. This is a picture I hope you've come across at some point. It's really important to know what we're seeing here. These are the adrenal glands, and we're seeing all of this discoloration. This is hemorrhage within the adrenal glands, and there's really only one thing that we need to know for the exam that causes this. It's Waterhouse 
Friedrich syndrome. So be sure you know this. If you see this image, they're getting at bilateral adrenal hemorrhage and they're getting at this disease. Moving on here, we have three arrow signs, which is nice because this is going to be a triple bubble sign and that means jejunal atresia, okay? We have this, the bubble signs from the stomach, from the duodenum, and from the jejunum. There's the atresia, so things cannot get past, and we're gonna get a triple bubble sign, which is very unique. Moving on here, we're gonna have a, a bit more derm. This is an example of pyoderma gangrenosum. These are painful, painful ulcerations that frequently affect the legs, and the exact cause is unclear. It may be an immune reaction. It is seen in inflammatory bowel disease, so your Crohn's disease, your ulcerative colitis. One quick thing to note, the most common dermatologic manifestation of IBD is erythema nodosum. I'm going to say that one more time. The most common dermatologic manifestation of IBD, of Crohn's disease, and of ulcerative colitis is erythema nodosum. But I do want you to know this other one, pyoderma gangrenosum, because it can be manifested from those diseases as well. This is going to be our last image here. We have more arrows, a lot of arrows in this video, but what we're getting at here is colitis. And this can be a little bit non-specific, could be infectious, it could be ischemic, but what we're seeing here is that there's some large bowel wall thickening, and it's called a thumbprint sign. It's almost as if somebody took their thumb and kind of pressed it on the x-ray right there. Like I said, it's not specific. It can be infectious colitis, it can be inflammatory colitis, and it's seen in other conditions like pseudomembranous colitis. So if a patient has C. diff and you see this image, you want to be thinking pseudomembranous colitis. Really important to know. That is the end of this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please hit the subscribe button and the bell next to it to get notifications for all of my latest videos. In addition to that, leave me a comment if you have any tips, if you have advice, videos that you want to see. I watch and read all of those, so please let me know. But thank you again for watching and good luck studying.